Is the Incredible Hulk as bad as everyone says? Let's find out. An experiment is performed on Bruce Banner. Something goes wrong, and Bruce transforms into the Hulk for the first time. He destroys the lab and injures several people, including Betty. Later, Bruce visits her in the hospital. He remembers a more intimate time with Betty. The relationship is more than professional, strengthening the incident's emotional impact. This isn't just a, a colleague he's hurt. It's someone he loves. General Ross forces him to leave, and Bruce becomes a fugitive running from the military. This three-minute sequence conveys a lot of information. Not only does it provide the necessary background for the rest of the story, it supplies a plethora of small details that foreshadow future events. The sound cannons will be used against Hulk in Virginia. One of Bruce's messages was intercepted, incentivizing him to use more encrypted communication methods. A list of known associates includes Leonard Sampson, who we meet later in the movie. Although it's weird that he's listed here, as I get the impression that Bruce has never met him before. Either way, these are just some of the details that can be found in the montage. If I have any complaint, it's that this information comes and goes too quickly. I don't know if your average viewer will catch most of this, even after multiple watches. We cut to Bruce in Rocina Favela, Brazil, and his life there is shown with similar efficiency. We're introduced to Days Without Incident. It tells us when he last transformed, and is a unique way to track the passage of time. The Days Without Incident also came out later. That's something I wanted to, you know, just to give it a time log, but not to, not to say five years later or like... Days Without Incident is currently 158. That's a little over five months. So we can assume Bruce has been hiding in Brazil for that time. We're later told that Bruce has been on the run for five years. He made it five years and got across borders without making any mistakes. He's not going to use a damn credit card now. Meaning Brazil is only the latest location Bruce has set up his life in. This establishing shot comes together to create a strong sense of chaos, unease, and claustrophobia. It's an enormous favela. Uh, 300,000 people live in there and, you know, see, see they build on top of each other. Once a guy builds a, a house in front of you, you want to get the view, so you build higher. So they're like, they really pile up, pile up. These communities that literally hundreds of thousands of people live in, they're built on hillsides and they're one structure on top of another structure on top of another structure on top. And there's little corridors that work their way through them and stairways going down to the next level. There's definitely no codes there. This is not the ideal place for someone who wants to stay calm. We're later shown that Bruce must stay calm to prevent transforming into the Hulk. So this tells the audience, Bruce is safe, but for how long? We're shown Bruce's daily routine. While he cooks breakfast, he reads from a Portuguese to English dictionary and watches local Sesame Street. Yes, that sounds like an excellent idea! He meets with a trainer to learn martial arts and breathing techniques. He wears a heart rate monitor to track his pulse. He works at a bottling factory where a bunch of tough guys bully him. They call him Gringo, implying they bully him out of prejudice. Their bullying is not arbitrary. His boss begs to put him on a payroll because of how smart he is, implying Bruce has avoided this so far. After work, he cooks up a solution in his homemade lab, a potential cure, and is disappointed with the results. So much of Bruce's character is conveyed in these 10 minutes. He is efficient, learning the local language while performing other tasks. He is proactive, he learns to fight, which would be useful against those that hunt him, and practices breathing exercises to prevent a hulk out. He's smart. He displays a knowledge of hardware and biology that most normal people lack. And he is ingenious, able to build a lab in a slum with a box of scraps. Quickly, we get a strong impression of Bruce's core characteristics. And this goes beyond basic things like level of intelligence. We get to see where Bruce stands morally when one of the tough guys is harassing... <laughs> Martina. Bruce attempts to walk away. That's the smart thing to do. Getting in the middle of someone else's conflict is a sure way to draw unwanted attention. However, Bruce can't stop himself from intervening. His desire to help Martina is stronger than his instincts for self-preservation. It's a small, simple way to set up a much larger payoff near the end of the movie. Bruce is also cautious. He wears a heart rate monitor to keep track of how close he is to transformation. He also stays off a payroll because it could be used to track him. However, when Bruce is asked to work on a faulty breaker, this happens. <laughs> Thank you.
This wordlessly communicates the great significance of this event. Bruce is very concerned about not contaminating anything with his blood. It's dangerous. Goddamn dangerous. He's careful about everything he does. Yeah. He's, you know, he knows that, that his body, he's a poison. In. Well, his body is lethal. His body is, his Absolutely body is lethal. lethal. Yeah. Then why doesn't Bruce wear gloves? Bruce was wearing rubber gloves before being asked to help. He specifically removes them beforehand. This is baffling, as the breaker is clearly sparking and therefore isn't de-energized, which only gives him more reason to keep them on. Top five tips on how to stay safe while working on energized equipment. Gloves don't necessarily have to be super fancy, but something that's gonna protect your fingers and hands, which are gonna be closest to the energized components. This contradicts Bruce's cautiousness and intelligence. What's worse are the consequences of this scene. Bruce cleans up the blood, but because he didn't see that the blood drop split in two, he misses one falling into a bottle. This bottle will eventually be shipped to the United States and will allow General Ross to find him. This is what incites the rest of the plot, but Bruce had no reason to remove his gloves. This both hurts the plot generally and Bruce's character specifically. And he's really taking care of, you know, not getting his, oh, he's wearing gloves, but you see that yeah. before he's, he's getting rid of his gloves. But anyway, then why did he take them off? After work, Bruce goes to his apartment and breaks out his laptop and portable internet dish. He opens an encrypted messaging program and talks to someone called Mr. Blue, who refers to Bruce as Mr. Green. A little on the nose, but it works. With Mr. Blue's help, he attempts to create a cure, but it fails. Mr. Blue says they need to meet, but Bruce says it isn't safe. However, he is willing to send him a sample of his blood. There is an implied familiarity between Bruce and Mr. Blue. Mr. Blue's messages have a friendly tone, and when the cure doesn't work, Bruce responds, another failure. Mr. Blue has been trying to help Bruce for some time. Also, yes, it is legal to mail blood. Assuming Bruce lied about its level of hazardousness, he would be able to ship it across the US. In Virginia, Ross learns that a man died of gamma sickness after having a drink that was bottled in Brazil. Milwaukee. A man drank one of those Garana sodas. Guess it had a little more kick than he was looking for. This is how they find Bruce. Ross assembles his top men for the mission. This includes Emil Blonsky, or as some might call him, Balonsky. Balonsky is described as an ace, implying great accomplishment and skill as a soldier. Born in Russia, raised in England, and on loan to SOCOM from the Royal Marines. You might wonder why a British soldier is in the US military. The movie bothers to include this throwaway line to clear up this potential confusion for the audience. It's one example of many that shows this movie's attention to detail. Is he a fighter? His first line says a lot about his priorities. Before anything else, he wants to know if there will be a fight. Later, we'll see why. Your target is a fugitive from the US government and stole military secrets. This is how they are justifying the manhunt. This either means Ross isn't being entirely honest with the military, or the military is in on the lie. Either way, Ross has intentionally turned an innocent man into a fugitive for a purpose we'll learn later. Trank him and bring him back. The transition from the helicopter blades to the fan blades symbolizes the oncoming threat. Like the introduction of the favela, we are subtly told that Bruce's safety is temporary. Danger approaches, raising the tension. Mr. Blue messages Bruce about blood tests he's performing. We linger on the yes, emphasizing how big of a deal this is to Bruce. This is the one thing he wants more than anything, and Mr. Blue has it. But Mr. Blue needs more data. Bruce says the data is home while looking at a photo of Betty. To Bruce, Betty represents home. Getting cured means returning to her. The film starts with Banner, who's on the run from the law, actively looking for a cure. He's wanting to come home. Bruce's dog alerts him to someone outside, stealing the element of surprise from the soldiers. Even the inclusion of Bruce's dog serves a purpose. Bruce is chased, and he cleverly uses the narrow packed streets to his advantage. This explains how we can outrun elite soldiers. 
There's no straight lines. So in essence, if you need to go to A to B, you're going through an alley, you're going on a roof, you're going through a street, you're going into a slum, onto a cobblestone street. It's, it's endless. Bruce's heart rate monitor beeps faster and faster. It adds tension by constantly reminding the audience that Bruce is at risk of hulking out. In a crowded place like a favela, that would be a disaster. It's very important for us to guide the audience in wanting for Banner not to hulk out, not wanting Banner to hulk out. And Brazil is like this. At first you're like, no, don't, 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 don't. You're surrounded by people. No, don't, 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 don't. Bruce is forced to slow down and calm himself. This reduces the risk of transforming, but increases the risk of getting captured. The tension rises further because he is forced to juggle between these two pressing concerns. Bruce bumps into the tough guys. He uses martial arts to avoid their attacks. This interaction is contrived. He happened to run into these exact people at this exact time. As stated before, favelas are teeming with people. What's also convenient is how Blonsky is in just the right place at the right time to spot them chasing Bruce into the bottling factory. Why does Bruce choose to go in there? Why go into an enclosed space like that? It is relatively secluded, so if he hulks out, he won't hurt so many people. Bruce probably also sees it as a good place to hide and calm down. Bruce is beaten up by the tough guys. When his heart rate monitor hits 200 BPM, he transforms. We now know the exact trigger point of the Hulk. Sadly, the precise BPM of the heart rate monitor isn't focused on again in the movie. It could have been used for creating tension since the audience now knows 200 BPM is the point of no return. The transformation and Hulk himself are obscured in darkness. This is a technique usually reserved for horror movies as the imagination can often conjure images more terrifying than reality. I wanted to start the movie as a horror movie. I grew up watching Frankenstein and, and King Kong and what's great about these movies is that they're monsters to start with. They're, they're absolutely scary. This represents the fear that Bruce and the soldiers feel towards the Hulk. To them, he is a monster. As Hulk's first scene, we get some good characterization. The tough guys and the soldiers attack him. Hulk batters them away and says, <laughs> Similar to Blonsky, Hulk's first line says a lot about his priorities. The first thing he says in the movie is to tell people attacking him, people who he can swat away like flies, to go away. He's never looking for trouble, on the contrary. Society is egging it on, egging it on, and, and he's trying to stay away so he doesn't harm anybody. The Hulk does not want to fight. He does so because he is under attack. This is even consistent in the opening montage. Betty's injury is an accident, and it isn't until he's shot at does Hulk attack the others. Blonsky is the last man standing, and is the only one to get a good look at the Hulk's face after which Hulk escapes. This is meaningful because it's part of the catalyst for Blonsky's obsession with the Hulk, which drives his character arc. When he's picking up, round, trying to round up the scientist, he catches a glimpse of some huge green kind of monster, and he decides that uh, that's kind of what he wants. Back at Bruce's apartment, they search through his things. This includes his laptop. You see, Bruce fled with his laptop in his backpack. When the tough guys cornered him in the factory, they took it and tossed that aside. Presumably, Blonsky discovered it after the battle. This is important setup for later. She helps him, maybe? They closed that door to him a long time ago. He's alone. He wants to be alone. Ross's description of Bruce's motives aligns with what Hulk said earlier. Really alone. He wants to be alone. Implying that Bruce and Hulk want the same thing. Ross understands that Bruce has isolated himself for fear of harming others and to find a cure. He hunts him anyway, implying that their goals are not aligned. At this point, we don't know for certain what Ross's motivations are. It's reasonable to assume that he views the Hulk as a danger to be contained, but there's clearly more going on here. It's the most powerful thing I've ever seen. Blonsky is in awe of the Hulk's power. But if Banner knows what it is, I'm going to track him down. I'm going to put my foot on his throat and that I'm going to... That was Banner. So if you're taking another crack at him, I want in. This is where Blonsky's goals start to shift. Before, he was just a soldier following orders. Now, he's personally invested in the mission. 
For his own reasons, he wants to face Hulk again. Bruce wakes up in Guatemala and gets a ride from a passerby. ¿A dónde va? A mi hogar. We understand that by home, he means Betty. He was resistant to the idea before, but in just one terrible night, he's lost five months of progress. It's like the myth of Sisyphus, you know, the guy mm. with the, the boulder that rolls you know, over the yeah, map. Yeah. Every time he thinks he's got something, then he transforms into the hog and has to back, go back to zero. Mm. Sisyphus defied the gods by giving humanity immortality. As his punishment, he would push a heavy stone up a mountain, only for it to roll back to the bottom once reaching the top. Sisyphus would be forced to repeat this process for all eternity. Bruce worked hard to set up a life in Brazil and pursue a cure. In one fell swoop, he lost everything, and is forced to start again from scratch. This is emphasized by Days Without Incident dropping to one. That's where he's starting, at square one. With the loss of all his progress, and Mr. Blue's promise of a cure, Bruce decides to risk returning home for the data. Bruce travels to Chiapas, Mexico. He sits, tired and dejected, and a little boy gives him some money, which he uses to buy clothes. It's a nice touch. They could have cut to Bruce with new clothes without explanation. However, the audience knows that Bruce has lost everything. So, they go out of their way to show how he's able to do something as simple as buy clothes. Bruce has a brief flashback to Blonsky shooting at him from when he was the Hulk. This is intercut with the memory of Betty laying injured after the incident. This evokes PTSD, emphasizing how traumatic the transformation is. It's both physically and mentally draining. More importantly, he associates the Hulk with hurting Betty. This is crucial to understanding Bruce's view of the Hulk and how that changes by the end of the movie. Due to Blonsky's growing interest, Ross tells him the real reason he's hunting Bruce. We've got an infantry weapons development program. Well, in WW2, they initiated a sub-program, biotech force enhancement. Yeah, super soldier. And I dusted it off. Got him doing serious work again, bold work. Banner's work was very early phase. But he was so sure of what he was on to that he tested it on himself. As far as I'm concerned, that man's whole body is property of the U.S. Army. We get some hints at a deeper motivation for Ross. He tested it on himself. And something went very wrong. Or it went very right. The experiment led to great damage and injury. This would reflect terribly on Ross, who allowed one of the scientists to act as a test subject. In that sense, it went very wrong. However, it created the Hulk, a being more super than any soldier that's ever existed. In that sense, it went very right. This line of thought will be expanded upon later. Banner's work was very early phase. It wasn't even weapons application. There are interesting implications here for Bruce's character. He thought he was working on radiation resistance. I would never have told him what the project really was. Ross felt the need to lie to get Bruce into the project. Why? So why do you run? He's a scientist. He's not one of us. Bruce wasn't interested in creating super soldiers. He was interested in making people resistant to radiation. A purpose broader than the military and more focused on purely helping people. Bruce is not a soldier and isn't interested in creating weapons. But he was so sure of what he was on to that he tested it on himself. This implies overconfidence in Bruce, a trait he hasn't displayed in the movie thus far. Keep that in mind. That's one more thing we'll return to. Blonsky, how old are you? 45? 39. It takes a toll, doesn't it? So get out of the trenches. You should be a colonel by now. Nah, I'm a fighter. I'll be one for as long as I can. Unlike Hulk, Blonsky likes to fight. And we came up with this idea of a soldier at the end of his career, and that's why he wants the thing. Like, yes, exactly, that's it. Blonsky desires physical power, and laments how age and wear and tear have weakened him. You know, if I could take what I know now, put it in the body I had 10 years ago, that would be someone I wouldn't want to fight. I could probably arrange something like that. That is why the Hulk has caught his interest. He represents power beyond anything he thought possible. This scene leaves me with some questions. Would Bruce normally have been allowed to test on himself? Maybe not. But Ross's presence implies he, 
the head of the program, allowed it. But why would he? He risks the life of an important scientist. If he dies, the program may die with him. We're trying other things. One serum we developed was very promising. Why was the other serum put on ice? Sure, Ross may consider the Hulk the success he was looking for, but it wouldn't hurt to keep pursuing other options.